What's going on? This is Ryan with Automatic Comics, and up next I'm going to talk about ways that you can upgrade or add big keys to your collection. Stay tuned. Alright, so before we get started, please remember to hit that like button and hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this. If you watch the video that I just released before this, I touched on a little bit about upgrading the books in your collection and so I thought it would be interesting to make a video about different options that you have for either upgrading books in your collection or adding those bigger keys to your collection and some of these may be just standard common knowledge but uh, you never really know and it's always helpful to talk through these and see some examples of ways that I've used this specifically to upgrade books in my collection. So I thought I'd also show some of my favorite books, ways that I have actually upgraded those uh, to get higher grade or, or better looking copies. So we all know that over the last year, prices of books have gone up a lot. So adding those bigger keys to your collection has gotten much more expensive as well. Uh, those are definitely the ones that saw the biggest increases in prices. So I started thinking about different ways that you could approach upgrading the books in your collection, different ways that you could add these uh, bigger keys or just improve existing books that you have. So here are five different ways that you can go about upgrading those books in your collection or adding these bigger books to your collection. So here's number one. And this first one, it's pretty standard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the normal way uh, to me that you would add one of these books to your collection or you would upgrade a book in your collection. And that is to just save up for that book. Now, it sounds easy, but I think we all know that it is not necessarily that simple. And I've been talking about picking up a bigger key, adding one to my collection for a while, maybe going after one of those bigger Silver Age keys, maybe a bigger key from the Golden Age. And the thing is, I'll, I'll sell some books, I'll have some money put aside, but then I'll see something else pop up. And that something else is a good deal. And my general philosophy is you never know when you're gonna see that deal again. If you see this, this big discount on a book, something where it's a big discount to fair market value or to what prices are currently going at, I just have a really hard time passing on that book if I have the money available. And that is a big reason why just saving up for a book isn't always as easy as it sounds. It seems like you could just put that money away, but if you see that other book out there and it's a really good price and you're like, oh, I could pick that up and then maybe I could either add that to my collection or use that to, to flip to buy another book, then it's hard to build that momentum of saving up for that bigger book. So it can be difficult, but one way that you could go about doing it is say you have just uh, a bank account set aside and just put money in there and don't think about it, don't act like it's there uh, to use for something else and just let it accumulate until you have enough to buy that book that you're looking for. But I know it sounds easy, saving up for that book, but not always that simple. All right, now number two, this is one that I actually talk about doing for myself all the time, and that's consolidating your collection. And I know this is something that can be difficult for a lot of collectors. I mean, there's a lot of people that have a lot of books out there, and so consolidating your collection, one, isn't necessarily easy, but it could also be emotionally difficult because you have a connection with a lot of these books and selling them can potentially be a challenge. However, this is what I talk about when I always talk about my uh, my keepers list or my, my 50 books. So this is what I do. I have 50 books that I put on what I call a not for sale list. Now it doesn't mean that they are never for sale, but it means that they are books that at this moment in time, I am not selling those books. If I get another book that pushes it off that top 50 list in my collection, then I will remove one of them from that list, add the new book, and it just continues forward. And so the reason that I like this is it forces you to really look at your books and decide which ones are the most important to you. And another big plus with this is as you are replacing those books, you get either better copies of existing books or, or just better books in general, higher grade books, then it improves the quality of that select set of books. So the general value of your collection will increase and just the, the overall said kind of like quality of the books will increase over time if you follow this basic process of setting a number of books that you're going to keep 
It doesn't have to be 50, it could be 25, it could be 100, it could be 200. Just set a number and then evaluate that set of books regularly. And if it's not on that list, put it up for sale and, and move on to something else. Now, how do you decide which books to keep? And that can be a little challenging, but one quick way, if you have multiple copies of something, keep the best one. Sell everything else, don't keep the multiple copies, just keep the best single copy of that book. And I've done that in a number of, of different books that I have where I've had multiple copies and I just keep that best copy and I sell the rest. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of those later. Another thing to look at is, have you looked at that book recently? If it's a book you haven't looked at in six months, a year, maybe it doesn't mean as much to you as you thought it did. And that's actually one way that I've looked at a few books recently where there were ones that I had on my not for sale list. My not for sale list started getting a little bit above 50 and so I'm having to go back and reevaluate again. And so that's one of the techniques that I'm using to remove books from that list is if I haven't really looked at that book in the last six months, is it all that important to me? Maybe not. Uh, the books that tend to be the most important to me often end up up on this wall behind me and so that's how I know that they mean something there's something I want to keep around and if it hasn't gone up on that wall or if I haven't seen it maybe it's not that important it falls off the list put it up for sale now another way is just to make a physical list so list out your books and which can be tough if you have thousands but you know which ones generally are the ones that are probably the most important to you pick the that 200 or 500 or whatever it might be and start evaluating that list. Put them in order of which ones you think are the most important to you. And that's where you really start thinking about which books mean the most, which books you really want to keep, which books you can let go. Now, you gotta remember, anytime you sell a book, in most cases, you can get that book back if you really do want to. If you find out afterwards, oh, this is a book that I did actually wanna keep, you can get it. Now, there are some rare instances where you get into Golden Age books and, and that kind of thing where it could be a really rare book. But even that, I've had Golden Age books where I've had multiple copies of what are relatively rare books. And so even with Golden Age books, you can get them again. It's not the end of the world if you sell that book. It's not like it's impossible to ever add that book back into your collection. And remember, as you sell those books, as you reduce that number that you're keeping, you now have additional funds that you could put into buying upgraded copies of books that you have in your collection. So then you're gonna start upgrading those books or other books that you had thought you couldn't afford and now you've got all this extra money that you could put into buying another book that would then maybe push one of those books off your list. So once you, you make that consolidation step, it gives you more options for what you wanna do moving forward. All right, now number three, and I've touched on this one already and I'll call this leveling up your collection. This is what I talked about in my prior video when I picked up that Ghost Comics number six, the 4.5 of Ghost Comics number six. Now this is really my personal favorite. I, I do like doing the, the 50, the top 50 books in my collection, but this is this one is my personal favorite method of upgrading the books in your collection. And so the first thing is to just get a copy of that book. It can be any grade, low grade copy, just have a copy of that book. Now that gets you into the book where now you at least have something there. And then if the prices increase, even if it's a low grade copy, the price of that low grade copy is also going to increase, which you can then utilize to pick up a higher grade copy of that book. Then you combine this with the first option that I talked about, saving money, and you save up for that upgraded copy. But then when you put that money out, when you eventually buy that upgraded copy of that book, you are immediately going to sell the other copy that you had. And so what that does is it reduces the cost basis or how much you really have into that book. So I've done this for a bunch of books in my collection. And so this is also a chance for me to talk about and show some of my, my favorite books in my collection. And so the first one I did this for was Hulk 181. And so my copy is an 80 qualified book. Uh, so it's missing the Marvel value stamp, but I had a 70 qualified that I had purchased and I bought that and prices afterwards went really high for, for this book. So I think I bought the 70 for like, it was like 1400 bucks or, or something like that. Uh, then I ended up picking this one up for I think like 3400 and then soon after because prices kept 
going up, I sold my 7.0 for 3,900. So I actually sold my 7.0 for more than I bought my 8.0 for. So I upgraded that book while also reducing the total amount of money that I had spent to get this comic. And I had also it ended up upgrading the page quality. So I got an 8.0 that went up to white pages instead of my 7.0 off white to white. So that was first example that I've that I've done that for. Now. Another example to show that this isn't just for Bronze Age books, modern books, that kind of thing. I did the same thing with my Batman number nine. And so the first time I got a copy of this book, it was a raw copy that I had purchased. And I never thought I would have two copies of Batman <laughs> number nine, uh, but I ended up picking up the second copy in a separate, uh, separate sale. And so then once I got that, I ended up selling my raw copy. And so that shows that even when you've got something where it's a, a more rare golden age book, a book that you likely don't see come up for sale very often, this all happened over the course of not even that many months, maybe six months. And so even a book that was as rare as this or as uncommon as this, I still ended up coming across a couple copies of it and was able to use that process to upgrade from a raw book that the person I sold it to it ended up grading out at a 2.0 uh, to this book as a, a 3.5. Now, one of my absolute favorite books in my collection is this next one, and I took a bunch of steps to get to this copy. And this is Fantastic Four, number 49, in an 8.5. And this, uh, this, this book is, it's a beautiful copy of <laughs> this book. I absolutely love this book. But I took a bunch of steps with different copies to get up to this one. And so the first copy I had was a 4.0, it was a nice looking 4.0, I've talked about it in some other videos where it had a bunch of tape on the cover, but it was unnecessary tape. It was like the owner had put it on to protect the book, so it was each corner had tape and that kind of thing. Um, so I had a 4.0, then I had a 5.0, then I had a 6.5, and then I, had, I finally got this 8.5. And I have sold all those other copies, so that is the process that I followed. As I got the next copy, that better copy, I sold the lower grade copy and kept the higher one. Now, I had hoped to eventually get into the nines for this book, but the prices on this book went just crazy over this last year. I bought this one back in 2020, and I, I think it was like 2,200 or something, and, and recent sales on this have been over 7,000. So I don't really see myself <laughs> upgrading to a, a, a 9.0 to, to get a higher grade copy than this, but uh, I do have this book as collateral that I could then, if I did get a 9.0, I could sell this one and get that money back out of it. So that's how that would continue to work if I did ever upgrade this copy. Now, this works as well with, with raw books. You know, it doesn't have to be graded books. And so I've shown this one recently where uh, this was the first copy I got of, of Vampirella number one. And someone actually commented on that when I remember when I did that video where they said they really liked that it was, I, I said, I was just getting a copy to get into the book. You know, I just wanted something that had me in the book. And I'm glad I did that because as I've mentioned in these prior videos about this book, it just keeps going up. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter what anything else in the comic market or prices are doing. This book sells for more week after week after week. And so I got a copy of it and then I'm going to sell this one now that I picked up my higher grade copy. And so that first one was about a 3.5. This one I think is about a 5.5. Maybe it could get a six. And so using that method again, you know, with raw books, it doesn't have to be graded books, but this is where you have to have some grading uh, ability so that you can evaluate these books and say that, okay, this book is better than this other book and upgrade them. And then you can sell that lower grade raw copy as well. Now, another book that I've talked about a number of times uh, that I've done this upgrading with is Archie Comics number 50. And so I originally, the first copy I got was a 2.0, and this is a similar book. It just, it seems to just keep gradually going up in price. So the first copy I got was a 2.0, then I bought a 3.0, and then I eventually got a 4.0. I've sold the 2.0 now. I am now also going to sell the 3.0, and so then I have just the 4.0. I am a little torn on it because even though this one is higher grade, the 3.0 has a flaw that, while it makes it a lower grade book, it looks nicer. And so I'm, I'm not sure which one, I'm, I'm probably gonna keep the 4.0, but the 3.0 presents better. So that's one of those situations where it's, it's tough to decide which one to keep because 
yeah, it's a higher grade, but it doesn't present quite as nicely as the as the other copy. Now, this was a this was a fun one. Um, so this is where it, I had a, a raw book that I am planning on getting graded largely with the purpose to sell. I might I might just not get it graded. I might just sell, uh, end up selling it raw. I don't know. Uh, but this was Avengers number one. And so I, I have this 4.0 now and I had never had a copy of it. And then on uh, one of Barry Gary's claim sales, I ended up buying this one from Jay. And so it's obviously a very low grade copy. It's like a 0.5 and probably restored because of all the pen over everything on it. But this got me into this book, which I'm very happy about because the prices of Avengers number one went up extremely fast. And so that's what I'm talking about. You get yourself into a copy of that book, then even if the prices go up, you have that book and then you can sell that one and use that money to reduce the total cost that you have in that higher grade copy, which is ultimately this, this 4 -0. So again, it, it doesn't just work on kind of like medium keys, you know, it works on pretty big keys. I mean, Avengers number one, a pretty big Silver Age key. It's another book that you can uh, upgrade doing that same process. Now, this one, uh, I, I wanted to talk about this one because I just sold the, the other copy that I have. And one of the characters in this book has now become extremely hot recently. And this is Iron Man 55. And so like most of us know, this is the first appearance of Thanos. That's why this book is generally the key that people go after. Also the first appearance of Drax, but the character that is now very important that is the first appearance in here is Star Fox uh, because of the recent news about Star Fox and Harry Styles. And so that has made the sales on Star Fox related books go up. And that is likely the reason my 8.5 sold. So I had an 8.5. Uh, now I had followed that same process with this. I originally, my first copy was a 6.5. Then I upgraded to an 8.5 and sold my 6.5. Then I upgraded to my 9.2 and sold my 8.5. And so it's just that, that same process over and over again. It just, I, I really like it. It's a very good way to upgrade your books and keep your costs down. And then the last one here, and this is possibly my favorite cover of all time. It is definitely up there uh, in my in my top five. And this is X-Men number 101. I just, I love this cover. There's just, there's something about it. I really like the yellow and the blue. I, I just, this cover is just one of my favorites. And uh, I had a, a 9.2, I believe I had a 9.0 and I've sold both of those now, and then I have this 9.4. I also have an 8.0, but that one uh, wasn't as part of this kind of like upgrade process. But uh, but yeah, so a lot of different books, you know, different keys, some, uh, some of my favorite books in my collection, and I use that leveling up process to upgrade these books. All right, so now number four, and this is leverage discounted prices. And what I mean for this one really is CGC versus CBCS. And this is always kind of a, a hot button topic. It gets people worked up <laughs> you know, with, uh, with CGC versus CBCS. But I mean, I see it over and over and over again. And I have used this to upgrade books in my collection. I mean, you saw my Archie 50s, my top two copies now are CBCS books. And you will often see these CBCS books, same grade, selling for anywhere from 10 to 20, even sometimes a little more percent less than the CGC equivalent. And in reality, CGC and CBCS, they generally grade the same. I know I've talked about how I think in lower grades, I think CBCS is a little more forgiving. Uh, you're more likely to maybe get a one or a 1.5 instead of a 0.5 that CGC I think throws way too many books into. But when you get into the, the mid grades and the high grades, uh, they really generally just, they grade the same. I mean, the founder of CBCS was previously the grader at CGC. I mean, they generally follow the same methods for grading their books. So if it's just that you don't like the slab, the case that the CBCS book is in, just make sure that you're comfortable grading those books and that you really do think that, yes, that book is a 4 or that book is a 5 or a 6 buy that book, crack it out, 
have it regraded at CGC. Now that's where you do need to make sure that you have it a, enough of a buffer, a price difference between the two, because if it costs too much to then get it regraded and probably get it pressed again before you send it in, you're not really getting any value out of it. You might as well have just bought the CGC book in the first place. But if you can get it for a big enough discount and you really do feel that you want to have it in that CGC case, just like I said, crack it out, get it regraded. And there are definitely cases as well where you can see that that CBCS book is graded more harshly than what it, you would expect with CGC. So that's where having that sharp eye, really looking for those discounted prices, especially with a book that may seem like it's undergraded, uh, you could get that, that boost in the grade and you get that discounted price. All right, now for number five, and this is one that I personally don't use, but I have sold books this way, and that is to use payment plans. Now, like I said, I don't use payment plans. If I'm buying a book, I want to have the cash to buy that book at that moment. If I don't have that cash, I'm not buying that book. But that doesn't mean that this isn't a reasonable or viable option. And the reason that I feel that way is that there are tons of things that people buy on payment plans today that it's very acceptable, accepted to do that. An example is cars. People buy cars almost exclusively on payment plans. Very few people buy a car outright with cash and a car just goes down in value. The instant you buy it, you drive it off the lot, you're losing money. Whereas with a comic, it has the potential to drop, but in general, it's going to retain its value or it's going to increase in value. It is a investment that you're buying. So putting your money into that, you're, you're investing in something. And so it's just important to understand what you're getting into when you're doing that, understand the terms. So you set your terms at the beginning with the seller, make sure it's a seller that you trust because a big difference between a comic book and a car with payment plans, with a car, you're getting that car when you make that first payment. You can drive it around as you're making your payments. With comic books, that is not how that works. There is no seller that is going to send you that comic until you have completely paid for that book. And so you need to trust the person that you're, you're sending your money to because they're holding on to that book for you while you're making those payments and will then send it to you at the end. And there are plenty of good sellers out there that'll do that. Like I said, I have done that for a few people that I've sold books to. I, I see a number of sellers out on Instagram that do that, especially for, for really big books, these books that are you know, ten, twenty thousand $20,000, that kind of thing. Now, it is important to understand how these payment plans generally work with comics. The way it will usually work is because that person is holding that book now for you. They're not gonna gain anything else if say the price of the book goes up over the next month or two months, whatever the payment term is. So usually the way it works is if you then fail to make your payments, they're going to keep what you've paid and keep the book. So just make sure you understand that when you get into one of these payment plans, there are going to be restrictions and rules that people follow. And so make sure that you are going to be able to cover that cost. Now, most people are going to be reasonable if you keep paying, They're, they'll extend it some. I don't think anybody's real goal is to, is to just take the person's money and keep the book. You know, it's not, it's not like that. But when somebody's selling a book, they aren't doing it out of charity. You know, they are selling that book and they're not going to hold it for you forever. You just make sure that everything is clear and understood when you're getting into payment plans on a book. So those are five ways that you can upgrade the books in your collection or, or get those big keys or, or grails into your collection. Let me know, are there any other ways that you upgrade the books in your collection that you try to get those big keys into your collection? Uh, I know trading is definitely an, another option that's out there. Uh, let me know in the comments. If you thought this was useful, saw some fun books, uh, please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this. I've got more videos over here if you'd like to watch some of my other videos and the subscription button right here. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, I would really appreciate it and I will see you in the next video.